let's let's kick off. Um, so I'd like to thank the speakers ever so much for um, being willing to um, take part in this huge experiment um, and you know our our attempt to make this whole meeting uh, virtual and online. Um, and particularly our US colleagues that um, had to get up at about 4.30 in the morning to join us for this session. Um, we've got a lineup of six absolutely fantastic speakers and I, I'm, I'm really, it is a, a, a marvelous lineup. Um, the first three are gonna focus on um, Earth observation from space and then the second three focus primarily on planetary science from space. Um, and um, in case you, you, you're unsure where you are, you should be, um, listening to um, Union Session uh, 5, uh, which is on the future of Earth, Earth and planetary science from space. And our first speaker um, is Takeshi Hirobayashi, and he is the director of the Earth Observation Research Center um, uh, at the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA. So um, Takeshi, please um, go ahead. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Takeshi Hirabayashi and I'm director of uh, Earth Observation Satellite, Earth Observation Research Center of JAXA. Uh, it's a great honor for me to make a presentation in this uh, Union Symposium. Uh, today I would like to talk about the outline of JAXA's Earth Observation activities and the contribution to various issues. Uh, in this slide, I would like to talk about our satellite roles for the Earth Environmental Change Studies. Uh, we believe that there are three major scientific theses regarding the Earth environment. First, to where heat energy goes. Second, how fresh water variates. And third, uh, to where carbon and pollutant go. Uh, if, we, if we can find answer to these thesis, we shall predict extreme events that cause disasters. And we will be able to make ready for them by predicting future status of air temperature and water environment. To resolve these questions, uh, we need approach utilizing numerical models based on precise observation. Satellite ob observation are quite uh, effective to this approach because satellite can measure variation of Earth's environment continuously, consistently, and precisely. Uh, JAXA believe our satellite data greatly contribute to understand major scientific thesis such as as energy budget, global water cycle, and carbon and material cycle. Uh, to this purpose, we are actively collaborating with both domestic and international research communities. Uh, JAXA currently operates six Earth observation satellite or sensors on orbit to contribute both science and social benefit. These satellites monitor cloud aerosol vegetation, greenhouse gases, water cycle, precipitation, forest disaster, and so on. Uh, in this slide, I will talk about GCOM-C. Uh, GCOM-C observes spatial distribution, seasonal change, and year-to-year -year change of the key environmental variables such as cloud, aerosol, vegetation, ocean color, and so on. Uh, they can contribute to monitoring and prediction of the energy budget and carbon cycle through improvement of the Earth system model. For example, please see the left figures. Uh, global distribution and global change of ecosystem, such as vegetation index and chlorophyll H2A concentration will be a variation reference to the Earth system model. As you know, uh, global warming is one of big issues 
in recent years. Uh, it impacts uh, the most notable in the cryosphere. Here, mm -hmm. I'd like to show some long-term trend of cryosphere in Northern Hemisphere developed by the long-term satellite observations. Uh, upper middle panel showed ice, sea ice concentrations in the Arctic on 17th September 2019. On that day, the second minimum sea ice extent was recorded in the satellite observation history since 1978. Upper right panel is a long-term variation of daily sea ice extent in the Arctic since 1978, observed by several satellites, including GCOMW. Clear decreasing trend was found in the Arctic. And impact of global warming to cryosphere is not only limited to sea ice coverage. A lower light panel shows seasonal snow cover extent in northern hemisphere analyzed by JAXA using several optical images. Y axis is snow cover extent and X axis is year from 1978 to present. There are decreasing trends in all four seasons. Here is another example of importance of water cycle monitoring. Too much or too less precipitation sometimes cause undesir undesirable impact to our life. JAXA recently released a website called JAXA Climate Rainfall Watch. This provides information of extreme heavy rainfalls and drought in worldwide. Lower left panel is monthly mean rainfall in December to 2019, and right panel is calculated drought index. Stro strong drought was indicated in Eastern Australia in red cloud due to less rainfall compared to usual years. Uh, greenhouse gases observing satellite GOSAT and its successor GOSAT-2, a joint mission among Ministry of Environment in Japan, National Institute for Environmental Studies, and JAXA. A GOSAT series satellites provide accurate measurement of greenhouse gases for researchers and policy makers. GOSAT has been operated for more than 11 years since 2009, and GOSAT-2 was launched in 2018. Left figure shows the CO2 concentration observed by GOSAT and GOSAT-2. Compared to GOSAT, GOSAT has expanded the observation range over the ocean. And also, GOSAT improves the performance of the mission instrument. So GOSAT can observe the CO2 concentration of Africa, Amazon, India better than GOSAT. GOSAT is also equipped with a new function to observe CO, carbon monoxide. Lower light panel shows the CO concentration observed by GOSAT-2. You can see the high emission of CO from forest fires in Amazon area. And next, I'll show you example of global forest monitoring as a sink of CO2. This image shows a map of Amazon rainforest in 2007 and 2017. And the changes there, the green colored area uh, rainforest and yellow indicate non-forest areas. Red indicates the deforestation area during 2007 and 2017. JAXA has accumulated 
vast experience of L-band synthetic aperture radar instrument for more than 25 years since JEARS-1. Meanwhile, we have proved the effectiveness of L-band SAR to solve social problems through the forest monitoring, disaster monitoring, and so on. Uh, we'd like to contribute to the solution of various issues, including SDGs with L-band SAR on board L3s. Uh, here are upcoming our Earth observation missions. These four satellites are under development. At the left hand side, described ALOS 3, which is the next high resolution optical satellite. ALOS 3 will be launched in this Japanese fiscal year. It carries an optical instrument that has 0 0.8, 0 0.8 meters resolution of panchromatic band and 3.2 meters resolution of multi spectral 6 band with 70 kilometer source. The right hand side shows Eros 4, which is the next Air Band Star mission followed on Eros 2 and will be launched in Japanese physical year 2021. Eros 4 has capability of high resolution as same as Eros 2 and wide operation source that is four times larger than Eros 2's Eros 2. Uh, the left map is Hawaii Island and Eros 4 can observe the entire island of Hawaii at once. Eros 4 will achieve much frequent observation in global with high resolution. Uh, the left hand side shows the Earthcare mission. This is Europe and Japan joint mission to contribute precise understanding of climate change by measuring three dimensional global distribution of cloud and aerosol. JAXA and NICT are developing the Cloud Profiling Radar, CPR. CPR provides the world first satellite based cloud vertical motion. ESA provides the other three sensors. The right hand side shows the GOSAT GW. It carries two missions. One is AMSA 3, a successor mission of GCOMW for continuous water cycle monitoring. AMSA 3 has improved observation capability of snowfall and water vapor by additional high frequency. High frequency channels. The other one is TANSO-3, a successor mission of GOSAT series for continuous and improved observation of greenhouse gases. Uh, GOSAT GW is planning to be launched in Japanese fiscal year 2023. Um, three minutes, Takeshi. Okay. okay. Uh, to predict future of us environment, we also need numerical models of us system. Uh, JAXA collaborate with various model communities to utilize satellite data in their models to enhance future prediction and contribute to science and society. Uh, I would like to summarize my presentation. Uh, the main target of JAXA's Earth Observation mission is contribution to water cycle and climate studies, disaster mitigation, and various operation applications, such as weather forecasts, fishery, and agriculture. Uh, JAXA currently operates six Earth Observation satellites or missions on orbit for this purpose. And we will continue this contribution by launching for satellite in the near future. Regarding the next generation precipitation radar mission, uh, JAXA joined the ongoing ACCP architecture study in US. JAXA proposed the 
advanced KU band precipitation radar with Doppler capability, higher sensitivity, and wider source. Uh, we also collaborate with various model communities to utilize satellite data in their models to enhance future prediction and contribution contribute to science and society. Uh, I'd like to close my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Takeshi, for, the, um, for that presentation. And apologies to the audience for the slight issue with the um, aspect ratio and cutting off the, the edge of the slides. Um, we, we're aware of that problem, and um, hopefully it will be fixed in the next um, speakers. I, sh I forgot to mention that um, we're not going to take questions immediately after each speak speaker, but we have about 15 to 20 minutes at, at the end of this session where any questions that you've um, written in, in the chat box, um, we, we'll try and collate and put together and um, put to all, all our speakers right at the end. So we'll, we'll gather them all together in, in actually sort of try and separate them into Earth Observation and Planetary Science. So um, our next speaker is Josef Ashbacher, and he is Director of Earth Observation Programs and Head of ESRIN in Frascati, Italy. Um, uh, as part of the European Space Agency, so shows it um, far away. Okay, thank you, Jonathan, and uh, uh, welcome everyone. And I'm really glad to be in this uh, uh, in this uh, group of uh, very eminent speakers. Also, we have just heard Takeshi San uh, uh, introducing the Chaksa program, and uh, also as ESA, we are working closely with uh, Chaksa. Uh, Sandra uh, from NASA uh, will speak after me again. Uh, we are also working very closely with NASA, and I'm very glad to introduce the European part uh, of the European Space Agency on how our uh, Earth Observation Program fits into this international uh, context. Uh, so what are we doing with our Earth Observation missions? Uh, what you see here is uh, uh, showing our motto. Uh, we call it taking the pulse of our planet. Uh, so we really use our satellites uh, to, to make sure that we measure uh, the key parameters of the Earth system. That means uh, the atmosphere, uh, the oceans, the land surface, uh, the polar regions, and see and understand how they interact uh, and uh, how uh, our Earth system functions as a whole in order to uh, make sure that we have a good understanding of it, but also helping us to make uh, use of, good, of these data for uh, predictions, for simulations, uh, which of course are important information needed by uh, citizens and uh, decision makers. So this is the Earth Observation Program of ESA. Uh, it uh, is uh, grouped into three main categories. Uh, we have uh, missions that are fully funded by ESA member states. We call them Earth Explorers, which is the greenish color on this slide on the left-hand side. Uh, and there are a few of them launched. Uh, five of them uh, have been launched. The others are in preparation, and I will introduce them uh, later on. But they are really missions that are using cutting-edge technology to address burning questions of science. Uh, and this is exactly what, uh, what, what these uh, missions are, uh, are doing and, and uh, the way that they are being uh, conceived. Then uh, we are also developing the Copernicus missions. Uh, Copernicus, obviously well known, is the operational program of environmental uh, monitoring of our planet. Uh, again, there we are working very closely with the European Commission and the member states of the European Union. Uh, Copernicus is co-funded by the European Space Agency together with the European Union and ESA is implementing, developing all these satellites and then operating some of them. Some others are being operated by UMITSAT with whom we are working very close together. But obviously the European Commission and the European Union are leading the overall uh, program uh, from a pro programmatic and strategic uh, point of view. Then we have the orange part, which is uh, uh, the meteorological missions, uh, geostationary and polar orbiting satellites, where we work with uh, UMITSAT. Uh, again, UMITSAT is our partner. They are defining the user requirements. Uh, they're handing them over to our ESA uh, colleagues. Uh, we developed the satellite, we designed the satellites, we developed the satellites, uh, and uh, we put them on the launch pad. And at launch, we hand them over to UMITSAT for operation, who is operating uh, these satellites uh, uh, and again, feeding back requirements to us as ESA. So all together, uh, as you see, we have uh, 34 satellites under development. This is by far 
the largest portfolio which ESA ever had in Earth observation. Uh, and we are operating a, a good number of those uh, ourselves uh, and uh, uh, others are operated by colleagues across Europe. So this is a, a very solid portfolio of missions. Uh, we are uh, developing and building some of them in cooperation with our partners in the US and Japan. Uh, some of them are uh, done with European partners and some are done by ESA member states uh, alone. So what are these satellites measuring? And I'm showing now a few examples to highlight some of these capabilities. Uh, probably well uh, read in the more recent days and weeks have been publications of our Sentinel-5B uh, satellite uh, measuring in this case uh, NO2. NO2 as you know is a, a gas uh, that uh, is a pollutant uh, and you see here the concentrations of uh, NO2 uh, before and after COVID or in 2019 in a similar period as compared to uh, 2020 or uh, when uh, the lockdowns have been reducing uh, industry and traffic uh, or pollution from industry and traffic and you see that immediately these values are drastically reduced uh, about 50 percent uh, on different uh, places uh, Paris uh, even a bit more 54 uh, percent where uh, there's an immediate effect of uh, reduction of pollution due to the lockdowns uh, uh, that took place or they are taking place still uh, due to COVID. And these are measurements obviously extremely uh, relevant and we can uh, uh, we have done these measurements also over China, over the Wuhan area, uh, obviously the United States and other parts of, uh, of the world. India just uh, was published recently uh, with very similar figures. And you see the immediate effect uh, and the impact of people uh, on the quality of our atmosphere. And here is a, a picture, a photographic picture of uh, Milano. Uh, Milan has been very highly uh, impacted as you have all seen in, in the news. Uh, on the left hand side before the lockdown on the right hand side afterwards and I don't need to explain much to this picture it just uh, shows what you also see when you look outside your home office window that the air has been uh, has become much cleaner and uh, the quality has become has really improved drastically. Unfortunately this is uh, short-lived news because uh, the moment uh, we go out of the lockdown and the uh, industrial activity is picking up again. Uh, of course, pollution will immediately come back to the levels uh, as we had them before, presumably in some cases might even uh, be worse, which is uh, one big worry which many of my colleagues and myself have at the moment. Other examples, and we have seen uh, the example before of uh, Dakeshi-san uh, of deforestation, in this case another area, Borneo, uh, from uh, 2000 to 2018. Uh, you see the encroaching here of uh, tropical forest in uh, the red-orange uh, color. I uh, don't need to explain this picture, this is well understood, but just to show the magnitude of uh, deforestation as it is happening, but also the, the power of satellites to monitor these changes on a regular basis. And this example I've selected because it's particularly, it particularly relevant uh, also in our uh, discussion on COVID and pandemic uh, crisis and uh, health threats. And this uh, uh, little picture, which uh, is on, inserted here on the left uh, uh, corner, uh, is actually highlighting a much wider story that the change of our land use, deforestation, uh, degradation of agricultural areas, uh, and this uh, massive change at global scale also is linked with the uh, appearance of some of the health uh, pandemic uh, uh, crisis elements, which we see COVID being one of them, but also uh, Ebola, HIV, uh, swine flu, uh, and, and similar crises that have been, uh, uh, been reported, especially when they come from animals to humans, uh, as these uh, zoonotic uh, crises are, are being called. And there again, the power of Earth observation is very important. Let me show you on one slide uh, some activities which we have uh, initiated, and uh, as soon as we went into lockdown here in Europe, and I'm sitting uh, uh, at the moment in, in Italy, in uh, just outside Rome. Uh, as you know, this has been a heavily affected area. So we, I've asked my teams to really put together uh, very fast um, activities where Earth observation can help also during the uh, coronavirus uh, uh, health crisis and which information can be provided. So what you see here is we have been uh, putting together um, some uh, information on indicators that show 
the uh, lockdowns or the redu reduction of, uh, say, air pollution uh, due to lockdowns uh, as we went into the crisis. And obviously, when we go out of the lockdowns, we monitor uh, their changes again back to more normalized values. Not only air pollution, you have seen the example of N02 before, but we also are monitoring traffic congestions uh, border, uh, at, at borders, national borders. Some uh, national borders have had uh, uh, lockdowns or, or closures, and there we had huge traffic uh, jams uh, uh, on these borders. And uh, our president of the European Commission, Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen, was relying on our data and even referring to them in one of the uh, news uh, broadcasts uh, that uh, Copernicus data have been very helpful uh, in uh, uh, monitoring the situation. Also, uh, traffic on the roads, on uh, boats. Uh, Venice was uh, highlighted recently where basically tourism has uh, gone down to almost zero, uh, including also the traffic on the canals, uh, factory parking lots, agricultural harvest, and, and so on. Uh, we are constantly taking these images. We are doing this very closely with our partners in Europe, European Commission, but also with NASA and with JAXA, and I have initiated a, an international co collaboration also on this to make sure that the power of our satellites is being used in a harmonic way uh, to monitor the various uh, uh, impacts in uh, China, in Japan, in Europe, uh, and in the US. And we have comparable data uh, of uh, the situation as it uh, is ongoing and it is evolving. Another example, and this is quite an interesting one uh, for um, the use of one of the Earth explorers, this is ILOS. ILOS is one uh, quite remarkable satellite. I don't want to go into the technical details, but it is quite a unique satellite measuring wind speed uh, and direction in cloud-free atmosphere with uh, a LIDAR in ultraviolet uh, spectrum. Uh, but what you see here on the left-hand side uh, in this graph is uh, measurements uh, taken from aircraft uh, that are usually used in numerical weather prediction forecasts uh, by ECMWF in this case. Uh, the green curve is the one that uh, of the data which are actually used and the blue one that are uh, made available. And you see there's a big decrease from about 60,000 uh, uh, data sets being used, uh, sorry, 600,000 data sets being used down to 200,000 uh, due, due to re reduction of, uh, of air traffic, uh, which has really re uh, gone down drastically, as, as you know. On the right-hand side, you see the impact of these measurements because these aircraft also have temperature, humidity, uh, air pollution sensors. Uh, and uh, you see here that uh, before, COVID, uh, a lot of aircraft data have been used. Afterwards, not anymore because the planes are not flying. But uh, the ILOS data have been partially compensating this gap and have been filling in uh, to uh, compensate some uh, information which has not be become available due to international uh, air traffic. Another example is the ozone hole. Uh, this is a, uh, something that is uh, quite remarkable. We, uh, our scientists uh, uh, have been uh, uh, observing an ozone hole, not over the Antarctic, which uh, usually uh, is the place where it happens, but over the Arctic. Uh, this is a smaller ozone hole. That's not the same size as the Antarctic one, uh, but it is, has been an unusual feature. The Dobson values have, have been going down to about 220. And this, uh, uh, and, uh, I would say, fortunately has been reopening. So the hole has disappeared now just a few days ago, uh, but this is, uh, has been a feature uh, which has been observed here with 5B. Another example, permafrost. Uh, this is work done by Obu uh, and colleagues. Three minutes. Uh, and, yes, thank you. Uh, and this is uh, showing really the permafrost and how it expands. Uh, don't need to explain that, but this is a, an international effort. We are also engaging with NASA uh, to see uh, methane emissions uh, coming from permafrost. Let me go a bit fast in the next uh, examples. This is uh, showing the Arctic uh, oceans. Uh, which are predicted to be ice-free by 2050. You see the various predictions here. Again, our satellites provide crucial information to go exactly there. Uh, and another example uh, shown here is the carbon pump of the oceans, uh, the um, uh, phytoplankton activity, which is uh, in the ocean. Of course, we know very well the role of uh, rainforests uh, or their uh, reduced uh, uh, contribution to produce oxygen or absorb carbon dioxide on, on the other side. Uh, the oceans have similar functions, and you see here uh, with our measurements uh, the net primary produ production 
uh, which is shown on, on these examples here. And this is done with our Earth explorers, uh, which I've mentioned before. Uh, here they are listed. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, five are uh, in orbit. Uh, the others are being uh, prepared for launch, Earthcare, Biomass, and Flex. And the next one in row, which we have just uh, got approved and funded, uh, is Forum, uh, which is quite a unique satellite, which will measure the far infrared range of the top of atmosphere emissions uh, from six micrometers all the way up to 100. It's the first instrument that will do that uh, and will uh, obviously help us better understand uh, the dynamics of uh, uh, the radiation balances uh, for a better understanding of the Earth system. And just to mention that other candidates for Earth Explorers are in the pipeline. You see here Earth Explorer 10 and Earth Explorer 11. So just to say that into the 2030s, we have a program of science missions lined up. Uh, this is showing the Copernicus missions. Uh, we have six uh, families of satellites under develop right now. Seven satellites are flying. Another uh, set is, is being uh, launched in the next couple of years. Uh, and this is the next generation with the new instruments and new satellites that are being uh, kicked off uh, very soon. We have just uh, received the industrial proposal for phase B2CD uh, and they will be kicked off towards the end of the year. Uh, because time is a bit short, I'm not going into these uh, details, but just to say that they, are do, they do address climate, atmosphere, Africa, food as main topics uh, in order to have new information. Uh, a small highlight coming uh, very soon uh, in about a month's time is uh, the launch of FISAT, uh, which is a, a small satellite, uh, uh, which uh, is uh, actually the first one of, uh, of ESA of this category we are doing with an AI chip on board, uh, so intelligence uh, in space. Uh, in order to have an AI chip to monitor, distinguish clouded from uh, cloud-free areas and uh, therefore reduce drastically data flows. And this works a bit towards the concept I'm developing at the moment, which is called Digital Twin Earth, where we want to combine observations with AI, uh, with Earth system modeling, in order to better simulate parts of our planet and really uh, ensure to have a good information basis to, uh, to uh, inform politicians, the citizens of different impacts of our climate and the various situations. Time is short, so I will uh, conclude with this slide, uh, which is actually an announcement. Um, I am happy to announce uh, that we have agreed with uh, EGU, uh, and Jonathan has, uh, is playing a very important role in this, that we will have an award uh, for Earth Observation Excellence, uh, which will be starting next year, but we will start the process this year in order to select the candidate. But next year, the first time uh, this award will be handed over at EGU, hopefully in Vienna next time and not by <laughs> virtually by screen. Uh, in fact, I would much prefer being in Vienna right now among all the colleagues. But uh, we will have a very nice prize awarding ceremony and you will hear very soon uh, an announcement on this website uh, on how it works and how you can participate. But we really targeting young early career scientists and researchers to hand over this award and I thank you all for your attention. Oh, thank you so much for that Joseph um, uh, and uh, thanks for the exciting announcement. I think there'll be more details about the award both from ESA and hopefully uh, communicated from EGU on our website and through our social media channels as well in due course when the details um, come out and I think I think the call will be sometime in June I think um, uh, th thanks very much for that very, with all those amazing topical examples, um, Joseph. Um, our final speaker talking about Earth observation is Sandra Kaufman, um, who is the Acting Director of Earth Science Division at NASA HQ in Washington, D.C. Um, and Sandra, I'll, I'll hand over to you now. Okay. And uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, say good morning again. And uh, it is uh, quite an honor to be here with uh, uh, Takeshi San and, uh, and Joseph uh, from uh, um, Earth Observation. And of course, uh, Lori and Anatoly from Planetary and Gunther uh, from Solar Systems. Um, so I'll just give you a very big top level broad view of, of uh, what we're doing uh, on our science. And let me see if I can scroll here. Uh, just the four topics, um, you know, the overview, uh, what we're doing in dedicated big data, and what we're doing related to uh, COVID. Um, uh, so, um, of course, uh, uh, in the NASA Earth Science, uh, we pretty much, it's a, it's a very comprehensive program. And, um, you know, our ability to quantify the limits of Earth systems predictability 
is uh, completely dependent on our sustained fundamental research effort that we have uh, measuring, um, you know, atmospheric composition, carbon cycle, climate variability, uh, and so, so on and so forth. You know, so the, the quantity of these observations and, uh, um, and the modeling that, that we use uh, to predict and simulate it is, is uh, you know, what drives uh, our scientific uh, uh, discovery and, and, of course, you know, how we can apply them, uh, all of these to the societal benefits. Um, so um, uh, in uh, Earth Science uh, at NASA, uh, we have um, um, basically a soup to nuts complete um, uh, program, you know, fly the uh, element, uh, uh, research and analysis, and the, the applied sciences and technology, and we combine uh, all of these in order to, um, uh, to, to do the work that we do. Um, so this is a timeline of current and future dirt science missions that we have uh, in earth science. And, and, and I'm not gonna go in any uh, detail in any uh, of, of the missions, but I just wanted to highlight currently, we have uh, 20 satellites on orbit, um, measuring um, um, you know, all of the, 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 the quantities that, that uh, you saw before and, and more. Uh, and, um, and we have um, uh, quite a few um, uh, number of satellites under development currently, uh, uh, I believe it's 14 uh, that we are going to launch between uh, now and um, uh, 2027. Uh, and um, uh, it, it is a, about a $2 billion program uh, annually. Uh, of course, uh, we couldn't do uh, the work that we do without uh, the partnerships uh, that, that, that we have uh, with many countries around the world, and uh, we are very grateful uh, for them, uh, be able to work with them and, and learn from them and be able to uh, combine uh, uh, our data and, and be able to um, uh, do uh, measurements and discoveries that we couldn't do uh, otherwise. otherwise. Uh, so uh, these coming... Uh, I would say a year, year and a half. Uh, we only have uh, two, two launches. Uh, of course, uh, the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich, uh, which uh, is uh, done in partnership with uh, um, ESA, CANES, uh, EC, UMSAT, and, and NOAA. Uh, and uh, Landsat-9, we just had uh, the KDP uh, uh, D, and um, uh, we are the, uh, launching it uh, in June 2021. That's the, the LRD. Uh, however, we are uh, saving the March time frame uh, in case we can uh, launch it a little bit earlier. Uh, but this is Landsat 9. We've been going at it for a long time. The same thing with uh, um, uh, the type of measurements uh, uh, with Sentinel-6. Um, and uh, we have a very um, uh, I will say mature now, um, uh, commercial and small sat data acquisition program. We began um, acquiring data from um, uh, commercial entities. Uh, originally, uh, uh, we did a pilot with uh, three companies, uh, Digital Globe, Planet Labs, uh, Aspire, uh, and um, um, the program, uh, the pilot results indicated that the data are of sufficient, quali sufficient quality uh, for continued access, and we are uh, currently negotiating long-term contracts. Uh, I think uh, the Planet Labs um, uh, contract is pretty much uh, um, uh, all settled, and we are going to continue uh, uh, buying data uh, uh, from them. Uh, with unlimited access uh, to the Planet Scope uh, data for NASA research activities, we are um, uh, onboarding a new company, uh, and then we are going to release a uh, um, uh, photon ramp, an RFI, uh, in late 20, uh, 2020. So decadal survey. Um, so in 2017, uh, the decadal survey, uh, uh, the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Earth Science decadal survey was released. And uh, we have a number of measurements uh, and uh, observables that uh, we uh, that we need to make in, in the future. And, and that is where our future the, of our sciences um, uh, is headed right now. Uh, of course, you know, you saw the, 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 the comprehensive program that we have uh, in the number of uh, missions that we have on orbit and the number of missions that we are currently uh, uh, developing in our program of record. But as we um, uh, proceed with, with launching those missions, we are uh, currently uh, um, uh, studying and, and developing the architectures for these designated observables, these uh, targeted observables, 
uh, in, in, in these um, um, aspects that the decadal survey uh, is requiring us to do. Uh, so um, uh, we have uh, the five designated observables that are the, uh, the mandated ones that we are supposed to uh, uh, do, uh, which uh, are the um, aerosols, clouds, convection and precipitation, mass change, surface biology and geology, and surface deformations. And those are the, um, uh, basically, uh, um, some of them are in, in a continuity of, of uh, data from, from past missions. So for example, mass change, there will be a uh, continuity of the, gra uh, the grace follow-up type uh, measurements. Uh, the aerosols, clouds, convection, and precipitation is uh, uh, in, in almost a, um, a continuation of uh, the type of GPM kind of data plus, you know, and, and if you look at it, you know, in, in we are using, uh, looking to use new technologies, looking to use new partnerships, looking to use uh, uh, commercial uh, data by, um, um, we are going to be doing uh, campaigns. Uh, so it is a, a, a lot of work that we have a, a ahead of us. Um, so uh, on the Earth Science Explorers, uh, there we have um, um, uh, six new um, observables that we need to uh, uh, implement. Uh, and in the Earth Venture continuity, we just selected the first uh, mission uh, and we targeted with the radiation budget. Uh, the mission is at Libra uh, being uh, implemented by LAST. And uh, a couple measurements uh, that um, the decadal um, uh, dictated that we do, that we uh, target for the incubation, and those are the uh, planetary uh, uh, boundary la layer, the square photography, and, and vegetation. And uh, uh, those kinds of things are the currently. Uh, uh, working uh, to define activities that we need to do to, in order to mature those uh, those part, uh, observables. Uh, so just a little bit more in, in depth on, on those uh, measurements that the, 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 the designated observables, you know, the ACCP. Uh, this one has um, uh, identified like 13 applications and the way that we are the, uh, working uh, in defining these observing systems is um, by looking at applications right at the beginning, at the forefront, uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, we want to uh, do the research uh, in, in the analysis. Uh, but in the end, uh, what drives um, Earth observation is the, the societal benefit and, and, uh, and how we can uh, uh, use this data for the, benefit, for the global benefit, for the benefit of all uh, on Earth. Uh, you know, so uh, in relation, the relation to ACCP, uh, we are looking at you know, agricultural modeling, monitoring aerosols, uh, aviation, climate model, um, uh, modeling disasters, etc., uh, and, and designing the, the missions that right up front uh, with the, the applications in mind. Uh, the same for mass change, uh, looking at, at large scale uh, earth dynamics me uh, measurements. And, uh, and of course, uh, this one is a little more of a continuity of what we have uh, with the um, uh, Grace follow on, but you know we are that looking at partnerships across uh, uh, the other agencies across the world. Uh, you know, in, in trying to figure out what what is uh, you know how we can enhance uh, uh, the science that we uh, uh, that we want to get in the future for uh, for mass change, um, surface biology and geology. This is uh, uh, almost a, the newer one uh, for us because this is uh, going to be a hyperspectral mission, and. Uh, uh, we are um, uh, working a lot of different uh, angles of, of partnerships uh, associated with uh, uh, SBG and, and, uh, and um, looking at um, uh, these type measurements, uh, uh, you know, and in, in we have a, a number of agencies already participating in the studies uh, with us and, and trying to figure out what is the, the best way to implement um, uh, this mission. This is likely the mission that is going to be uh, the first one being implemented um, in in the in of of the of the five um, measurements that we uh, have designated from the decade of. Uh, and and the last one, the last study we have in here is the surface deformation and change. And this is uh, you know along the lines of what we um, are working with ISRO uh, on uh, uh, NISAR with NISAR. Uh, of course, uh, you know we haven't launched NISAR yet. You know, so this uh, mission is likely to be the, the very last mission that we uh, um, implement uh, uh, way uh, in the future. Um, so, um, and, and I'm not going to brief this, uh, this slide, but this is, uh, this is just the top level um, uh, observing priorities uh, extracted from, from the decadal and the type of um, uh, target observables that they want us to do. 
Um, and I um, just wanted to um, 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 talk about the technology aspects. You know, we have a, a, a very large portfolio in ESTO, uh, our, um, our science technology office. And uh, in, in this slide, you can see uh, uh, how we have um, lined up uh, all of the 20 observables highlighted in the decadal. And uh, you can see all of the investments in technology that we have uh, uh, in each and every one of those uh, uh, observables. Um, the colors, uh, the, the open circles, you know, we have investments in uh, information uh, systems, in um, uh, observation technology and technology uh, validation. And um, uh, we, we continue to find investments in, in all of these areas, plus, you know, uh, uh, more. This is just a summary of what is applicable to uh, the earth science uh, decadal and, and, and what we are doing in, in, that, in that line. Um, and so just uh, one, one slide I have on, on data systems, but uh, you know. Three minutes. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so to efficiently, efficiently handle all the storage and compute the needs for the large uh, missions that we have, uh, SWAT and ESA, um, we, we um, need to, you know, acquire and process and procured and distributed all this observational data, uh, and we need to find a way to do it um, in a more cost-effective, flexible, and scalable uh, way. And uh, we are looking at artificial intelligence, machine learning, and, and, and all of those new aspects that, uh, that we can. Uh, we are uh, looking to going from the current size of approximately uh, 30 uh, petabytes to approximately 230, uh, 250 petabytes in 2025. So, uh, uh, it is a, um, a lot of data. And uh, uh, the last couple of slides I have, uh, just uh, uh, on this um, um, time you know, of COVID, uh, we have a number of activities, and, and I'm not going to uh, read every bullet, but uh, um, as Joseph explained, uh, we are uh, collaborating uh, with uh, uh, ISA and JAXA uh in in uh looking at uh this thematic focus uh, dashboard uh, for the air quality number of ships number of cars climate etc uh and uh, also uh, uh the uh, covid 19 space apps challenge at the end of may uh severed so um, uh we have a lot of uh, mapping support and exploring methods with them um and, and i'm going to jump to um uh, a couple of aspects you know disasters that program uh, we have um, uh, continued to support preparedness and everything. COVID-19 uh, uh, high-performance computer consortium, that is a White House initiative uh, to bring together all of the uh, excess uh, performance uh, in the computers in the federal government uh, for the COVID-19 research. Uh, and uh, we've been working with other partners uh, uh, across cities in the United States and uh, uh, in, in the rest of the world. And uh, we also released a um, uh, call uh, for any um, additional um, suggested research that uh, we might be able to uh, get ideas across the, the, the rest of the US. Uh, and uh, we have uh, our, um, our Space Apps Challenge, as I mentioned, uh, May 30th and 31st. And again, we're working with uh, Jack and Isa uh, on this. And uh, uh, we hope that uh, you all um, uh, will participate in, in this uh, Space Apps Hackathon. Um, just uh, go to the spaceappschallenge.org and uh, you're going to be able to uh, find the information on how to participate. And uh, I believe that is my last slide. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you very much, Sandra. Um, again, um, a, a number of very topical um, elements and uh, topics that you, you, you're including in that. Um, I'm going to hand over um, chairing of the session now to Hakan, and we'll move on to the planetary sciences um, part of this session. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. So uh, we go on with the planetary talks here now, even though some of them may even touch on uh, on our observation as well. Um, so the first speaker out now is uh, Laurie Glaze uh, of uh, NASA headquarters in Washington DC. So thank you very much for uh, coming up this early hour of the day. And uh, Laurie is just the director of the Planetary Science Division. So we are all excited to see what's, what's going on there. So please, Gloria, go ahead. Thank you, Hakan. Uh, and good morning and thank you to everybody uh, for inviting me to speak with you this morning a little bit about uh, NASA's planetary science program. 
Um, I'd like to begin with um, a slide showing our uh, planetary science uh, fleet. Uh, this fleet uh, is, uh, is made up of about 25 missions right now. Uh, if you look at the uh, legend in the top right corner, the missions that have fonts in green or blue are the missions that are in their primary or extended operations. There are about 13 of those currently in operations. Uh, and there are another 12 listed here in the yellow or orange fonts that are either in formulation or implementation. And of those 12 missions, those are all planned to launch over the next six years between now and 2026. So it really is an amazing time for planetary science and we're so excited to have such a, a compelling uh, portfolio right now. And part of what makes it so strong is, uh, is our international participations and our international uh, collaborations. And so here I've highlighted those, um, those missions uh, in the planetary fleet that uh, have substantial, planetary, uh, substantial international participation. Those with the pink are NASA-led, and those that are, have the blue circles are those that are led by our international partners. Um, and you can see there are a number of missions across the solar system. And in particular, if you look in the Mars box, you can see that the international participation, international collaboration has really made for um, a strong uh, presence at Mars uh, and an amazing, consistent, and long-lasting uh, Mars science program. While I'm looking at the, the Mars box here, let me just point out that the uh, Mars 2020 rover down here in the bottom right corner uh, is, uh, is actually on schedule for launch in July. Uh, uh, the window opens on July 17th. Um, as we've gone through all of the impacts of COVID, NASA has uh, had a very measured and, and conservative response um, with attention and uh, hands-on work on only a very, very, very few activities across the agency. Uh, but Mars 2020 is, is one of those activities that's uh, being kept on schedule where we're making sure that we're keeping all the personnel safe uh, and that we have lots of precautions in place for their health and safety. Uh, but that activity is moving forward on schedule. Almost all of the hardware is at Kennedy Space Center and being prepared uh, for launch. And of course, the rover also recently received its name. Uh, it was named uh, uh, by a, a young man from Virginia and the name of the rover is now Perseverance. Uh, we also just recently named uh, the technology demonstration helicopter that will ride on Mars 2020. Um, and that is called ingenuity. And perseverance and ingenuity um, are the uh, human qualities that are going to get us through uh, this whole COVID-19 experience, I'm certain. So I wanted to talk a little bit about our approach to international collaborations and how we decide where we're going to collaborate and where to make those investments. Uh, one of the most important things, of course, is to expand our capabilities, to build beyond what we're able to do alone and work together um, and, and especially on things that are, uh, are ambitious, very ambitious, maybe larger than could be done by a single agency. For example, Mars Sample Return, which I'll get to in just a moment, and speak a little bit more about the partnerships that enable uh, that particular activity. There's also, we're seeing many, many more, more uh, emerging uh, from other agencies around the world uh, that want to begin exploring further into the solar system, such as South Korea, India, Israel, United Arab Emirates, all exploring and trying to move beyond uh, Earth orbit. And there are a lot of opportunities there to work th with those agencies um, and start to build new capabilities uh, across the solar system. When we collaborate from NASA, you can expect that uh, delivery of excellence in science and engineering, uh, reliability from us as a partner, and that will adhere to a set of, of principles such as the peaceful use of outer space, um, always ensuring open data. One of our core principles is that all data collected uh, from our missions are made available to the public, as well as models that are used for interpretation of the data. Um, another core principle is merit-based competition. We have many of our programs that are based on, uh, on competitive models that allow creative new ideas uh, to come to the and then a transparency in that whole review process and how we make selections for the various uh, missions that are going to go forward. As well as uh, responsiveness and ensuring that we have methodical decisions that are made in a timely manner so everyone knows what to expect. I thought I would give a few examples. I can't talk about all of the 
sessions here. There's just not enough time, but I would like to give a few examples of our partnerships that are ongoing at the moment. We're very, very excited to be working with ISA and JAXA on Bepi Colombo. Uh, this, of course, is a mission uh, that launched in 2018 and it's now on its way to Mercury, will arrive in 2025. NASA contributed the Strophio instrument to this mission, which will study the exosphere of, uh, of Mercury. Uh, but in addition to that, we've also providing some um, deep space network support. And we just recently participated with ESA and JAXA in the selection of some additional scientists to support the mission. Uh, and we're, we were able to select three US scientists to participate in Bepi Colombo, uh, an interdisciplinary scientist and, and two guest investigators uh, with an emphasis on analysis of the data that Bepi Colombo will collect as it flies by Venus. So there's an, an opportunity there to collect additional data and do more science um, in, that, in that area. So we're very, very excited to be a part of that mission. Looking forward, uh, we're also participating with ESA uh, on the uh, Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, or JUICE. Two minutes, uh, uh, Lori. Thank you. Um, and so on JUICE, we're providing several instruments. I'll speed up. Uh, we're also at JAXA on the Mars Moon Explorer. JAXA has really demonstrated their ability to do sample return missions with Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2, now on its way back from Ryugu. I'm very excited to participate with JAXA on the Mars Moon Explorer to land on Phobos, to collect samples and return those, where we're providing the Magane instrument as well as pneumatic sampler. And then the Mars sample return, as I mentioned, an ambitious effort to bring samples back. When Perseverance lands on the surface of Mars, it will collect samples in Jezero step of sample return and will launch in 2026, a launch from uh, with an ESA leading an Earth return orbiter and NASA leading the sample return lander, working together in partnership to bring the samples back. We also work together uh, on competed missions, uh, such as one, one type example would be the InSight mission, uh, currently on Mars carrying seismometers from France, a heat probe from Germany, uh, now, after two years on the surface, has collected hundreds of, of seismic signals and starting to interpret what's going on in the interior of Mars. We're also partnering with ESA on the Envision mission concept, which is currently in competition, medium class mission uh, in the M5 competition, uh, where we're work working to uh, uh, potentially provide a synthetic aperture radar for, for that mission. Um, looking forward in planetary science in NASA, we are just kicking off our decadal survey looking uh, to the, the next decade forward to seeing what the science priorities will be going forward. Um, and we continue to work with our traditional partners where we're continuing to deliver the high quality collaborative science that comes from those partnerships. As I mentioned, more and more nations are merging uh, with interests in planetary exploration and we're exploring ways to engage in that growing expertise. We're also working uh, with, uh, to develop new frameworks uh, with existing partners such as ESA to I identify new ways for ESA to engage on our, our PI led, our competed missions, um, in addition to the individual member state agencies that already provide instrumentation, find new ways to partner directly with, uh, with NASA and ESA on those PI led missions. I feel like we're in a golden age of planetary exploration uh, with incredible interest around the world. Uh, we have an amazing portfolio. We're getting an incredible amount of science return. Um, there are more and more nations than ever participating, and uh, by working together, we're going to enable even more science for the global community. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Lori. This is an impressive uh, program indeed. And uh, I think uh, I and many people with me approach, uh, appreciate very much your approach to international collaboration. That's, that's really great. And, and, and of course, uh, Everybody appreciates the open data policy that you, you have. So, so thank you. Thank you a lot for this and for coming up this early hour. Um, we need to proceed to the next next speaker. And uh, the next speaker is, uh, is here towards the east from, from Europe in, rather than from the west. And it is um, the director of the Space Research Institute IKI in Moscow, Russia, Anatoly Petrukovich. Uh, uh, Iki, as, as you may know, has contributed to, to a large number of, of, of the Russian and the Soviet uh, research in, in, in the past and, uh, of course, also in the future. And uh, as I'm working myself now on, on Mars, uh, we have a, a strong collaboration with, uh, with ExoMars also. So, Anatoly, please go ahead with your presentation.
let me start. First, I want, first of all, I want to start with a disclaimer. Um, Space Research Institute is not a part of Russian Space Agency. So this, uh, my presentation is a, a view of Russian science, Russian space science on Russian space planetary program. It is not an official point of Russian Space Agency. But otherwise it is complete and uh, I think you will enjoy it. Um, if we look in the history, with, uh, in Soviet and post-Soviet times, we have a lot of missions with the most successful the Venus missions. And uh, unfortunately, starting from 21st century, there was not so many planetary launches from Russian spacecraft. But we, uh, thanks to our international par partners and their open prog programs, uh, of um, of guest instruments on European and American spacecraft have launched a lot of uh, Russian funded instruments on uh, uh, lunar, Mars and Venus missions and recently on BP Colombo, Russian participation there is in, in three instruments, Febus, Musasi and MGNS. And uh, these Russian uh, contributed instruments are paid by, officially paid by Russian space agency. So they are very thankful to Russian space agency also. And uh, there are some, some examples. This is a Russian instrument on uh, Curiosity rover, which is working already seven years. It is active instrument, including neutron sounding. Actually, it is a, this instrument is used on, in geology to probe oil drills but now it used also in space. And fortunately for us, uh, official lifetime of this instrument, because it has some expendable resource, this neutron generator was one, two years, but is, uh, it, uh, it actually works already for seven years, Wolf intensity of the beam is not that large. So, and there is a unique trace, we can see, for example, a unique trace of water content along the Curiosity path. Uh, another, Example, bright example of our international collaboration is ExoMars project with, with European Space Agency and uh, at least Russian scientists up, up, upload to brave um, European Space Agency and Russian Space Agency officials who uh, agreed on such a deep collaboration, very uh, extensive collaboration and I would say unprecedented level collaboration in hardware of this mission. The simple first launch was um, Trace Glass Explorer in 2000, Trace Glass Observer in 2016 when Russia contributed two uh, instrument, two or four instruments, the infrared spectrometers and collimated neutron detector. Much more difficult part will be in 2022, which includes the rover and landing platform. And the currently a flight models of the all Russian instruments are in Europe, including rover, two rover instruments and 13 instruments on landing platform. And we are still waiting to launch in 2022. Another important part of and new part of uh, ExoMars project, which is always, uh, which is uh, sometimes overlooked is that for the first time, Russian ground segment, Russian deep space network antennas are um, converted into mode which are fully internationally, com internationally compatible. And so currently 50%, more than 50% of ExoMars data are regularly received on Russian antennas. And this um, experience is now used in, in, in other projects and I hope in more planetary projects in the future, but now just recent days, we had the uh, first time that uh, regular download from Russian astronomy mission, space and X-ray mission, spectrum X-ray mission was received by a European station. So I think this is also very good contribution, very nice contribution to our future collaboration. Looking on first results, this is um, one of first results from collimated neutron spectrometer, which was used for detailed water mapping. It is actually a close copy of the spectrometer which is flying for 10 years already on NASA LRO mission. And so its requirement is, uh, the main goal is to make a detailed uh, maps of the water content and ice con water ice content on uh, Mars. And here you can see the first map of first 20, 250 days of mapping, which shows a lot of details which were Previously, not observed the, the more with less uh, with less uh, 
uh, with less collimated instruments in the previous missions. Another bright example is the first results on methane on with astro astro atmospheric chemistry slew, which is a high performance occultation spectrometer. And, uh, and the first results with methane is that unfortunately this particular occultation measurements does not confirm the levels of methane by um, seen by other missions, but there is always still have so many years to find some maybe variations of methane uh, across them across Mars. In, in, in the more future, we have very uh, in interesting, important club now on level of size definition team with NASA, discussing Venus mean in about 2030 which will include a lander and long life stations. We are also considering atmospheric probe satellite to see, uh, to test plasma and exosphere environment. And this uh, mission is now being very seriously considered by Russian space agency to be included in the official uh, space program. And this I, will have, I hope will happen in this year or maybe next year. Um, if here I think I am gradually switching to our moon programs and here is the first slide is the history of the Russian and Soviet moon exploration in three pictures. So there was a bright program of automatic landings on moon which ended with the uh, in, in 1976 with the lunar sample return mission Luna 24. In the midway there was a Russian made instrument on the NASA LRO, which also this collimated neutron spectrometer, which uh, made one of the most precise map of the possible water ice content, which we now measure as one to ten to percent at one uh, at the subsurface layer of regolith. And based on these uh, maps, we plan our future um, lunar program uh, with the focus on the landing in the sub in the polar regions, and the first landing should be already in 2021. It's mission which we now call uh, Luna 25, and uh, the mission is uh, practically ready uh, for this date. And this, um, at least, scientific instruments are supposed to be delivered to the uh, industry in the um, end of this, uh, in the beginning of the summer. In more detail, if you look on these first Russian missions, uh, lunar missions in more detail in 2021, as I said, we will have a Luna 25 lander, which is uh, supposed to be mostly to test safe landing in the subpolar region. In 2024, there will be an orbiter with a target to do some um, stereotopography, exospheric studies, subsurface radar, and it will include also data relay in international standard to be used for some with some landers. In 2025, there will be next landing missions, Luna 27. The main goal is to drill about two meters inside the subsurface polar regolith and analyze uh, volatiles. We plan to have a sample return mission, which is now not fully confirmed, I mean the date, which is now uh, expected to be launched in around 2027 or 2028. And this, all these missions have a significant international participation. Many European countries contribute in instruments on the national level and ESA take parts with the so precise landing systems, drill machine and some also individual instruments. And finally, I would like to comment shortly on the space resistance activity in uh, Earth observation. It's of course uh, definitely not uh, has a scope of European agency or other uh, any other agencies. We do not operate satellites. We mostly operate with data. And within this activity, we created uh, uh, open access, almost open access archive of the global um, remote sensing data, which now includes more than 3.5 petabytes online and in, is operates more than 100 servers across Russia. We have a more, more, more than 100 science institutes as users and uh, more than 20 government services are provided uh, with government contracts delivering some specific data. And the key uh, um, uh, speciality of our data center is that we 
oriented low and middle resolution data which have global regular global coverage and which cover more than 20 years so we can track climate change uh, look on sustainable agriculture technologies monitor na natural systems like forest and waters and here are some examples of the coverage during last uh, some week in february this includes uh, international partners like Landsat or Sentinel and also Russian observation KMSS on board Meteor. Uh, these are some examples of our level three products which are regularly made, uh, including some um, uh, involvement already scientists. These are tip, uh, maps of land cover in Russia, of arable lands, of forest fires, of tree volume, and there are many other products. These are just examples. And using long term, uh, data archives we can do we can visualize for example climate change uh, visible in change of forest type on the then on, on the area of forest types in russia so on this plot you can see that the dark needle leaf forests which are mostly northern forests they a little bit decreased during last 20 15 years while most often type forests are stay at the same level or gradually increase so this, uh, in, this, actually, this is actually a signature of two, pro, two processes here. First process is a change of climate, warm, warming of climate, and the second um, aspect is, uh, is forest industry, which is targeted mostly on dark needle leaf forest, which is mostly economically productive. Finally, there is a short summary of the systems which we deliver, geoinformation systems which we deliver to Russian agencies. This includes uh, environments which provide information on meteor parameters, on forest fires in real time, on, uh, on fisheries um, in the nearby seas, of agriculture inventory of a remote validate of uh, in the, in the inventory of agricultural lands, and also some. So more scientific system like uh, water quality in seas uh, and uh, volcanic activity monitoring systems. So thanks a lot. That's my final slide. Thank you very much, Antonio. And uh, also thank you for including the slides on those observation. I was not aware about um, that you had so many activities on those observations uh, going on in Iki. So um, I remind also uh, the audience to uh, put questions in the Q and A uh, box. If you have, you can just add that any time during the talks, and then uh, we take them after the last talk, uh, which will come now. And the final speaker is uh, Gunther Hasinger, who is the director of science at European Space Agency, and he's located in uh, in Spain, just outside Madrid. So in isolation, as all of us. So Gunther, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. It's, uh, I'm very uh, happy that we can present uh, in this way in these difficult times. And I'm very happy about so many people joining uh, the, this session. And I will uh, now concentrate on the solar system missions in the ESA science program. So planetary, but also heliospheric uh, missions. And what you see in this slide is the summary of all the solar system explorers and it is sorted into uh, four different categories. The first one is the legacy category. So we are standing on the shoulders of giants like Rosetta, Cassini-Huygens, uh, Ulysses, and, and others. Uh, and then this middle line is the number of missions which we are currently operating uh, in orbit. Uh, and uh, there are the two new elements that I want to focus a little bit today, solar orbiter on one hand, uh, and then Bepi Colombo that has uh, caught some excitement uh, in the last few uh, weeks. Uh, we are currently preparing um, a large number of new missions. Um, Laurie has already mentioned JUICE, uh, has al also mentioned MMX together with JAXA. Uh, we are participating in the ExoMars, um, uh, in the whole Mars fleet, and I come to Comet Interceptor. And then there's a category about the dreams. Uh, one of them is Envision which is a Venus mission uh, together with NASA as a competition in the M5 slot. And another one that I want to mention at the end is the possible ice giant uh, mission that is um, hopefully on the horizon. 
So let's start with uh, solar orbiter. So this happened uh, in February, just before the crisis really hit us hard. And so we are very glad that uh, the launch was so beautiful. Uh, originally, it looked like the rocket is flying directly to the moon, but it right made its uh, way in, uh, into the solar system. And since yesterday, Solar Orbiter has actually entered inside the Venus orbit. So it is on its way uh, towards the sun. Um, and the very first activities were to switch on uh, all the instruments. Uh, and this is a nice sequence where the magnetometers uh, have been switched on. Uh, the booms um, folded out. And I'm coming back to the magnetic field because um, this is uh, an important element of the fleet that we now um, have. In the meantime, uh, all the 10 instruments have been tested and switched on. And there is actually the commissioning phase will end uh, in June and we will make a major announcement about um, the, the successes uh, so far, but everything looks, uh, looks really good. Uh, the launch of Solar Orbiter reminded us of another beautiful launch, which uh, was uh, just in uh, October 2018, Bepi Colombo. Uh, again, the moon was up and this was launched from uh, uh, Kourou in French Guyana. Uh, and Bepi Colombo uh, over Easter in the middle of the corona crisis actually uh, was playing billiard uh, with the uh, Earth. Um, uh, Bepi Colombo is on its way in the solar system. It has to go uh, several times around the sun uh, and it is doing gravity assist maneuvers both in the Earth and then later uh, Venus and then later Mercury. And the first one of these gravity assist maneuvers was actually happening um, on Good Friday. Uh, unfortunately, the weeks before, the uh, European Space Operations Center had to uh, reduce the operations of their planetary missions because of a COVID uh, situation. But right in time for the, uh, for the Bepi Colombo flyby to the Earth, everything was working very well. Most of it remotely, but there was a small number of people in the um, uh, operation center. And what I will show you first is there is a little um, uh, selfie camera on, or several selfie cameras on board of Bepi Colombo, and they have been switched on. And when Bepi Colombo was approaching, and then when it was actually flying by, and then when it was moving away, and this is a little movie that was taken by these selfie cameras. Okay, and on its way, uh, several of the instruments um, were actually switched on. Also, uh, also Bepi Colombo is still packed together in a, three, uh, sec a stack of three satellites, but we were able to operate several instruments and I can show you a few results of these instruments. The first one is the magnetic field, which has been acoustified here. <laughs> And so you see when Bepi Colombo is entering the magnetopause, the magnetic field becomes very quiet. And uh, this is what you hear with the sound of the magnetic field during the flyby. In parallel to the magnetic field, there were also particle sensors uh, that were measuring the particles. Um, and so here you see the magnetic field and here you see the signal of those particle sensors at the time when the magneto sheath was um, uh, crossed. And then uh, later, when on its way out, when uh, Bepi Colombo flew through a more quiet area, you could also see the particles together with the magnetic field. And then there was an, a very interesting uh, first because uh, we were training the MERTIS instrument, which is a, a mid infrared thermal imager, thermal infrared imager, which was actually uh, observing the moon. And what you see here is the raw data. And this is the calibration source. And so you see it's completely dominated by um, uh, the calibration source. But when you subtract the two from each other, this is the signal of the moon. 
And when you project the signal, then you see here the pixels uh, on the surface of the moon. So this is the first time we trained um, an, a mid infrared thermal camera on one of the solar system bodies. And this is very powerful. When we arrive um, at the Venus flyby, we will use that instrument. And also when we finally will arrive um, uh, at Mercury. Um, and we also have asked amateur astronomers to look at the signal from Bepi Colombo. What you see here is there was an eclipse. This was the first time Bepi Colombo was actually not seeing the sun. Uh, and so you saw the, the uh, spacecraft uh, on the sky with the, sky, with the stars um, going through. And now it's reappearing here. And you see it again after the eclipse. And we have actually uh, created um, a competition, a photo contest. Uh, and the winners of that photo contest have actually been announced just yesterday. And so if you look at the social media, you can actually see all the beautiful uh, remaining images uh, that have been taken from ground. Um, and what was very nice in this particular case was that our orchestra of heliophysics um, uh, instruments uh, was actually observing simultaneously. We were able to switch on solar orbiter right after the COVID situation. Uh, and we also measured with cluster simultaneously uh, with Bepi Colombo during the flyby. And this gives us a very good calibration, intercalibration between all these instruments. And we are looking forward when, Bepi, when solar orbiter actually very soon will reach an, a situation where it can observe simultaneously with Parker Solar Probe on the NASA side. And so this orchestra of um, systems, and actually I have to mention also there's the Earth Observation Swarm, which is closer in here. And we are also preparing the SMILE mission together with our Chinese partners. So we will have a whole orchestra of instruments available to really study the inner heliosphere. Now let me move on to the longer term plans uh, to the longer term vision. This is actually a slide that shows not only the planetary missions, but all the ESA missions in the science program. And it shows roughly the size of the bars are roughly the amount of money that is spent on all these missions. And you know that when you are building a large mission like Bepi Colombo, for instance, you are roughly building for 10 years and then you launch it. And so currently at the year 2020, we are preparing JUICE for a launch in 22. We are preparing SMILE. Um, I mean, I'm also only mentioning the planetary and solar system uh, mission. I'm coming to a Comet Interceptor. Then there is the M5 uh, potential candidate for uh, uh, Envision. And then we are also talking about the possibility of another um, fast and flexi mission that I will uh, come to. Uh, this is the signature of the launch contract for JUICE, which is always a kind of um, celebratory uh, aspect. Um, so JUICE is on its way uh, to for a launch despite uh, the COVID situation. We are still convinced that we can launch it in 22. We are working very hard and I'm glad that NASA, I'm very thankful to NASA for uh, the support also of that uh, mission. And then I would like to mention this uh, interesting case. We have um, just a year or so ago selected a completely new type of flexi mission. Uh, it was realized that we could actually use uh, some of the launch capacities uh, of our medium class launch for the Ariel spacecraft. And we selected the Comet Interceptor, which was an idea to launch uh, to an L2 position and then to wait until a new fresh comet is coming in, or even as it becomes more and more realistic, maybe an interstellar visitor that uh, enters the solar system for the first time. And then the comet interceptor would basically fly to that place and then intercept that and makes uh, three-dimensional measurements with two sub-satellites. So this is a new type of mission that we were able to approve and we are working very hard to um, prepare it for a launch in 2028. Uh, and then let me come at towards the end to the discussion about a potential ice giant mission. Um, you know that both uh, Neptune and Uranus, the only time they have been visited was by the Voyager 2 spacecraft many, many years ago and we got these beautiful pictures. Uh, and in the meantime, both of these planets have turned out to be extremely interesting. 
and not, not only on their own right, but also because it turned out that in the exoplanet statistics, uh, most of the exoplanets are somewhere between uh, Neptune, Uranus, and Earth. And so um, those two ice giant planets become a very important element of understanding the formation of solar systems uh, in general. Now, the situation is a bit uh, difficult, and Laurie has mentioned the NASA um, uh, Decadal Survey. Uh, last year, we have made three ESA studies to study potential contributions to such an ice giant mission. Um, but it turns out that the window for a possible joint mission where you could launch something to both Uranus and Neptune is already partially practically closed because the, that would have to be launched before the end of the decade. However, a Uranus mission only could still be launched um, in 2034. So we are very um, uh, kind of interested uh, in the decisions that NASA and the National Academy of Sciences will do. And so the Ice Giant mission is currently uh, a very interesting potential for the future. And that brings, yes, thank you very much. And that brings me to our um, even longer term future. Uh, as you know, uh, ESA is planning their strategic plans uh, in typically 25 year timescales. Um, we are still uh, living off the Horizon 2000 program and have just started implementing the Cosmic Vision program. But already 25 years before, you have to pre prepare for the next um, challenges, you have to prepare technologies and so on. And so we have kicked off what we call Voyage 2050, which is the strategic plan for the years after the last uh, Cosmic Vision mission has been launched, after ESA has been launched. And this was a workshop that was held here in Madrid um, a few months ago. And it, it was actually attracting a very large interest. And uh, we got on the order of 100 white papers uh, for mission concepts and uh, science topics. And we also had a large interest in the applications for the topical teams to select the priorities for that. We got about 10,000 or more responses from the broad public um, in our engagement study. And so currently, despite the COVID situation, uh, the topical teams are working and we are expecting the recommendations for the future uh, um, in this fall. And I'm pretty sure that uh, the planetary system uh, is very heavily um, also rep uh, represented in, this, in these uh, recommendations. And so with this, I would like to end and would like to thank you very much uh, for being with us and for uh, keeping the interest up. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gunther. And it's uh, great to see that there is a good future on in Europe and also in many other countries in the world. So we, I think we have a good, good number of presentations here. So uh, thank you all for contributing to this. And we have had a good audience as well with uh, still well about 300 participants. It was even up to almost 500 for a moment. Yes, but yeah, up to about 500, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to thank all the speakers for being so professional, sticking to time and um, working with this kind of new approach and, and the, all the vagaries of the technology and everything. I, I think it actually worked really well. And we have a few questions from the audience. I, uh, also, thank you to, to the speakers who have been answering questions as we go along. But there are some that I, I want to kick off with a question really for all of you, which comes from Hans Hoybrick, I think it is. Um, uh, he says to all the speakers, um, actually, I want to slightly expand on this question. I had a related question. He says, how do you think the activities of new space companies with, in brackets, interplanetary ambitions such as space exploration will affect the future of Earth and planetary observations from space? But it's, it's, uh, I'd like to expand it. Um, so, um, you know, the space agencies um, try and cooperate on, um, uh, certainly on the space segment, maybe less so on the ground segment. Um, in terms of um, not competing in terms of the, the kind of missions, but with uh, increasing number of private companies launching uh, both Earth observation and planetary missions. Uh, how does that work in terms of, you know, collaborating and making sure there's not duplication of uh, resource and, and um, missions? And then related to that is uh, this age of the perennial question of space junk. Uh, you know, we had some really clear sky conditions in, in the UK in April, 
and I went out at 9 p.m. and I could see um, Starlink. You know, what is that? Uh, 60 satellites that are up there in low Earth orbit right now, and what, a few thousand that are planned or something? So, um, could, could, I know there's a lot in there, but you know, it's, it's a really a, a, a growing problem, both in terms of competing programs and uh, space debris. I don't know, who wants to kick off? If you wish, I, I can. I've got the question. How should we how should we do this? Um, Sandra, uh, you, will, could, you want to go ahead, Sandra? Ladies you. first, yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm, I'm happy to to uh, uh, start up if if it's okay, uh, and and I'll be brief. But uh, you know, related to um, uh, the SpaceX stuff of the world and the, all of the new uh, uh, launch um, um, companies, I think is is a, a, an opportunity to. Uh, uh, attempt to lower the cost of the space, you know, in, in many ways, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that they are competing with the, the work that we do as agencies, in particular with, with NASA. I mean, we continue to push uh, new technologies. We continue to work with uh, uh, the launch services and uh, we continue to have our, our, our own uh, uh, launch vehicles. But, uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the long run, you know, we, we also uh, give these companies contracts to to do what they do and and to help us uh, put our satellites into space or take them a, a, any place else. You know, so I think uh, uh, it is a symbiotic relationship that uh, is very much needed. And uh, access to space is always expensive. Uh, we need to uh, find a way to to do it uh, in a more efficient way and in, in a cheaper way. And uh, and we continue to work with uh, you know uh, with these uh, partnerships that we have with the industry to to ensure that we have um, uh, reasonable access uh, uh, to space. Uh, related to space junk, uh, uh, of course, uh, we have all these other little uh, companies uh, that are um, launching CubeSats now, you know, so we have uh, a lot of uh, other uh, commercial entities that are um, launching their, their um, um, satellites. They provide an amazing, um, uh, products that uh, that we are using and uh, is beneficial. Uh, we have to continue developing technologies in order to uh, figure a way to dispose of all of those things that uh, we we haven't been very good at it. And, uh, and I'm going to leave it at that, uh, Joseph. No, thank you, Sandra. And I I can just uh, more or less um, confirm what Sandra is saying. Um, um, I mean, we are as ESA, we are a space agency. Uh, we are by no means in competition with these private companies. It's the opposite. Uh, as a space agency, we are a development agency and we want to develop the space sector at large. So we have lots of uh, contracts uh, with these new space companies um, and they have different uh, angles. Uh, in some cases, it is uh, technology development uh, to help them uh, sorting out one or the other problem they, they have or they may have. Uh, and, uh, we have also contracts with uh, some of them on data buy that we buy their data and therefore give them a prospect for uh, a business development. Uh, and we integrate their data um, with the other more conventional data from bigger satellites. So I really want to uh, foster an end-to-end -end system architecture of combining big and small, uh, bigger satellites, which are certainly uh, much more accurate and have, uh, I would say, in terms of quality, a, a different uh, uh, measure to than, than the smaller ones, but the smaller ones usually fill the gaps in terms of observation frequency. So these two things go perfectly well together. And uh, in ESA, I have really launched uh, a number of activities to to do exactly that, to to support these new space companies. Uh, we have uh, Fee Lab, we have the Fee Week, uh, we have a, a lot of initiatives where we really want to work with those and hopefully uh, make them uh, successful players on 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 the market. Uh, Joseph, while you're speaking, actually, um, I just uh, briefly, um, we had a question about, you, you mentioned the digital twin Earth concept, and we had a few questions about that. Um, do you want to say just a couple of words on yeah. that? Yeah, it's, uh, many people are interested. It's a very new concept. Uh, I would say it's probably uh, um, something that uh, is being developed. I've answered some of the questions online, so that, that's why you probably yeah. don't see them anymore. Uh, but just to say, uh, uh, it's um, what I feel um, is that, uh, and this is a bit of a larger uh, debate, uh, we have excellent capabilities being built up in space right now by NASA, by JAXA, by Russia, by ESA and other space uh, agencies. And I think on the observation part, we have either 
good capacities in space already or a clear plan of where we want to go. And you have seen all these plans just a few minutes ago in the presentations. Where I think where we have a gap, um, which is uh, certainly need, which needs to be addressed, uh, that takes time, is to make sure that this excellence in space is matched with an excellence on ground, uh, meaning access to this data, transforming this data into useful information, but even more to use them to simulate situations of our planet. And this uh, is the digital twin Earth concept that we combine the observation excellence we have in space or coming up uh, in space with uh, the Earth system understanding from a science and modeling point of view with AI and similar means that come into in, er in order to make predictions of certain uh, elements of our planet. Let me take maybe a, a, an extreme example just to highlight a bit what, what I mean. Uh, you all have followed last year the debate uh, of two different heads of state of Bolsonaro and uh, Macron, for example, on the deforestation of the of the rainforest of the Amazon. And I'm not taking sides of either one, but there was a debate. One was claiming this is uh, uh, this is a forest that has a, a global implication and therefore global implication for climate and, and the people. And the other one was more saying, no, no, this is on my territory, don't, uh, don't bother. This uh, is my right, what I do with, uh, with the forest or deforestation. Um, and I think what we really need is to simulate cases of what does it mean for, um, if you I would uh, never, nobody wants to see a complete deforestation, obviously, of the Amazon, but that you can simulate what would it mean just to either completely deforest or deforest 10% or 3% or 2% or reforest. And what does this mean in terms of climate change, temperature increase, uh, CO2, uh, you know, all the aspects, sea level rise at the end, but also the local impact on, on the people it's, itself. And you need a tool that allows you to simulate all this with all the information from space and on the ground and uh, I would say all the, the modeling aspects you have. Of course, you can uh, look for better examples that are not so drastic, like sea level rise or, uh, or food security and so on. And this is exactly what we want to do. Okay, yeah, no, that, so, I can see why there's so much interest. Yeah, go on. Jonathan, can I, uh, can I say a word on, um, from the planetary point of view on Hans Heubreich's uh, question? That so, so uh, and I'd like Gunther to and then Laurie. Well. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Oh, sure. point, sure. so, yeah, yeah sure. indeed. So I, I think uh, new space companies, in particular the ones that are doing um, uh, small satellites, CubeSats and so on, they, they are exploding in near Earth's um, environment. But actually there is now a development that also these smaller systems uh, are being used for planetary exploration. So I have already mentioned the uh, Comet Interceptor spacecraft, which will carry two of these small CubeSats. There is also the HERA mission, which is following the DART mission that NASA is, uh, the, the com is intercepting an asteroid, which also has two small sub-satellites. And I think Laurie will tell us about the helicopters and other things. So, so I, I believe that uh, small company um, expertise uh, and uh, do things, uh, doing things faster, smaller, uh, is en encroaching into planetary science. But on the other hand, it is still very far from dominating its uh, we still need these large missions that um, are going into the outer solar system, which cannot be done by, I think, the new space companies. So, right. Laurie, sorry. <laughs> Laurie. No, no, it's okay. Um, I just had a couple of things I wanted to mention that are, I think, uh, add a little bit of dimension to the conversation. Uh, there was a conversation about the importance of uh, SpaceX and the new space competition in the launch market, which has been really important. But there are also an uh, incredible amount of new interest in uh, uh, providing services. Um, and so we're experimenting now uh, with some of those uh, capabilities right now in our commercial lunar payload services program, where we're buying services from commercial providers. We now have um, uh, two uh, companies under contract that are uh, scheduled to launch in 2021 and a third that wants to launch in 2022. I mean, in these cases, uh, we are not procuring a, a specific, uh, uh, you know, like a normal contract with them to, to launch our payloads. What we do is we buy a service from them where we pay them according to the amount of payload that we want to fly. They have other customers uh, beyond just uh, NASA at this point, uh, but we can fly our payloads. They're then uh, required to provide the power and the communications and the thermal control, et cetera. Uh, but then, you know, they return the 
data to us and, and, and that's all they have to do. They just deliver our payloads, they, they turn them on, they, we run them uh, and they return the data. So we buy that service from them and rely on them to procure the launch and they are responsible for all of that. We'll see how all, all of that goes. Um, so far, it seems to be working really well. Um, there's opportunities there as well for international participation and collaborations. We've had discussions with um, several international agencies that have interest in providing payload um, onto those uh, commercial providers. Uh, they could either work directly with the commercial provider or they can work through NASA, uh, where we have a partnership and then we can uh, provide a, a, an instrument suite or a payload suite uh, to the commercial providers. Um, and so we're already working that uh, for the moon uh, and also having uh, beginning conversations with some of those uh, commercial providers that have interest in going beyond the moon, perhaps even to Mars. Uh, ideas are out there for things like uh, uh, communications relay capabilities um, uh, throughout you know, the solar system or at Mars. And uh, so I think there's a, it's an expanding and growing area where there's a lot of interest. I do think it's gonna have an impact on how we do our science in a, in a good way, in a positive way, enabling more access uh, to these various uh, destinations across the solar system and more opportunities for us to, to fly the science payloads that we want to, that we wanna fly and do the science we want to do. Um, in combination with with what we do with our kind of agency led uh, missions, I don't think there's a again no competition. It's it's uh, it all works together. Uh, I'm I'm hoping uh, to provide more science and enable more science. So we're keeping an eye on the the commercial lunar payloads and see see how that goes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I mean that's that's that that's sort of related to the the space segment, but. Um, uh, maybe I direct direct this to Anatoly and Takeshi a little bit because b both of them mentioned that they uh, their agencies are developing um, databases of Earth observation data. Um, and Sandra showed an example of I can't remember how many petabytes you were expecting by 2025, but it was like an absolutely vast number of freely available. <laughs> right, right. I mean, absolutely huge uh, database. Of, of, of Earth observation data freely available to whoever wants it. And so, I mean, it's, it's, it's not necessarily competition, but what is the role of um, 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 your agency, Anatoly, and, and, and JAXA in terms of developing, you know, similar, but perhaps less extensive um, um, databases and ground segments? Yeah. Uh... Uh, actually, uh, JAXA uses various uh, sub data, and uh, we can, if uh, with the uh, entry of a private company to a uh, sub uh, field, uh, more satellite data will be, uh, we, can, uh, we can use uh, much more data satellite, and uh, we can uh, progress our uh, science understandings. And I would like to point out one thing. Uh, uh, we have to take care of space debris issues. Uh, uh, all organizations to follow the global standard uh, regarding the space debris mitigations uh, for the uh, protection of Earth's environment. And uh, sustainable development, su sustainable space activities. Uh, so, uh, uh, space debris issues are very important. Um, Anatoly, I, I mean, I, I, I see that you, you mentioned that you, um, that you had a Earth observation database that is being used by, I think, something like 100 institutes across Russia. Is, does that have, a, um, if you like, a national focus? Is it for... Um, Issues that are, are specifically relevant to to Russia, or or how does that work? Okay, um, thanks a lot for this question. Um, of course, we first of all, uh, um, our goal is to cover uh, the Russian territory, and for Russian territory, we probably have maybe not hundred, but ninety percent of everything freely available in the world. We have all in our data set. And of course, managing such huge data, and we expect tenfold increase in about five years, um, is a, 
a significant problem, but what we implement here is some community approach. We distribute servers and the expertise across our colleagues in all other scientific inst institutes and universities. And these uh, universities also con contribute us with algorithms and with expertise in specific, in specific areas, like volcanology, for example, we completely outsource to uh, Jeffy to uh, uh, this scientific community. As for uh, global coverage, we are now, we act, we are involved in some international programs on under United Nations umbrella or European Union umbrella, um, which uh, del deliver which um, um, develop some instruments which can be used globally. But here the main problem is ground truth. Because, for example, in Russia, we definitely know what is happening on the ground. We can access this relatively fast. But when we start interpreting data somewhere in South America or Africa, we definitely right. need some local expertise to confirm our conclusions. And this is the main problem, I think, of the global coverage uh, issues. We And I think it's uh, maybe some... Uh, not only European Union or the United Nations, maybe uh, main, main space agencies can also collaborate here to um, join the efforts to provide this ground truth support from uh, some remote areas. Then this will be, uh, will help a lot to uh, contribute our algorithms, which we deliver on the national level to accommodate them to the, uh, some other territories. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I'm, I'm a realize, um, I'm aware that time is ticking on um, and I guess we should probably wrap things up. There are um, a small number of quite specific questions about particular missions that are addressed to um, different speakers that you, you might have time just to type an answer to. Um, I should mention that um, the a video of this in, entire session is going to be posted on the EGU YouTube channel in the next day or so, an edited version. And um, if it's agreeable with the speakers, perhaps, um, if you're happy to provide the slides from your presentations to Chloe Hill, um, she, uh, if it's okay, you know, um, it, it may not be, um, but if, if you're happy with that, then she can post those alongside the, the video and um, anyone that's interested can download those and um, kind of view them um, at their leisure and with a bit more time. Um, so I'd like to wrap up the session and and thank again, really thank again our, our fabulous um, list of speakers. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I I think we we can all agree that the the future of um, Earth observation and planetary science from space is, is it looks really incredibly exciting from um, the missions that you've discussed and, and presented and uh, you know thank all of you for, for joining us and the audience for participating in this session.